fans are creating custom merchandise that have that don't even leverage the IP and are selling it to each other. They have bonds where they want to deepen. There's a lot of untapped benefit and value from the fan-to-fan -fan interaction um, and transaction and ecosystem. Hello, welcome to another Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And, well, super fandom, super fandom, super fandom. Now, unless you've been living on the moon for the last year, you'll have not been able to avoid the latest obsession of pretty much anyone working in the music industry. And if you are listening to this from the moon, you still probably heard about it. We invited Jaquel Horton, who's CEO founder of Superfan platform Fave, to talk about the nature of super fandom and also dig into how people should be nurturing it without taking advantage of enthusiastic super fans. Now, the industry's current interest in super fandom makes sense. Whether you're a DIY artist, a manager, a label, a booking agent, or pretty much anything else, it's clear that super serving your super fans makes them super happy and makes you more money. And also, it dovetails nicely with the director found business model that many are trying to build at the moment. So we talked to Jaquel about what she's trying to do with fave and super fandom, how she sees super fandom working in the music industry at the moment, and how you define a super fan as opposed to a merely very enthusiastic fan. And we also talk about how super fandom and serving those super fans can fit into a business model of pretty much anyone in the music industry. We also ask her how you can not take advantage of those super fans. As ever, it's an interesting conversation, so let's go over to Jaquel right now. I'm very happy to welcome Jaquel Horton, CEO and founder of Fave to the podcast. Hello, Jaquel. Hello, Joe. How are you? Yeah, uh, very good. All the better to see you. Now, first of all, some basics, please. So who are you? What is your background uh, in and around the music industry? And what is Fave? Yes. So thank you again for, for having me here. Excited to dive in on Fave. Um, so first with my background, um, you know, I always uh, like to share the two different ways I got to the seat on the professional side and the personal side. Um, professional, you know, spent my career through college and interning across in the entertainment industry, um, but always realized that product experiences, and I didn't even call it that beyond, you know, interactive experiences, allowed me the best flexibility to actually make a motion from someone. Uh, when I was under Viacom, and I was there for three years building different ex app experiences for fans. But I did spend uh, a big chunk of my career, almost eight years at Google. Uh, five of those uh, was at YouTube. Um, and I was leading the creator and fan engagement product areas. But in that lens of experiencing all the different ways that we can help people reach their audiences, I realized that there was a huge untapped potential in the audience themselves super under leveraged, largely ignored and underappreciated. Um, and I would say that um, realizing that underappreciation was because of my personal experience of being a fan uh, as a kid, right? Growing up and knowing the deep, deep, deep effort, willingness uh, and energy that I put toward my own fandom, right? It just didn't seem right that my favorite artist didn't know who I like, not know who I was, but see any input from my efforts mm -hmm. into their pocket, into their uh, strategy, nothing from any fan, it seemed. Um, and so it just seemed too broken of a puzzle to make sense. And again, 10 years, you know, 20 years almost later, uh, it's still super confusing to me. And so was we instead don't focus on the creator necessarily as the center point, but look at it from a fan perspective. What can that breed and what can that build for creators, right? How can we then serve them through that lens? Mm. Um, and so was born Fave. Um, and Fave is a platform that allows fans to show off all of the amazing activity that they're doing. Those that, you know, we know well, like streaming and social behavior, but also those that get uncaptured. Like if they have a tattoo of their favorite artists, if they create merch, if they have a big mer merch collection, if they throw events, if they introduce or convert other super fans, right? Uh, all of these things are super valuable, yet um, don't really get recognized. And so Fave allows that to turn into a really fun experience for fans to connect with other fans who kind of match these kinds of preferences and fan profiles, but then also pr pr provides different experiences from them. We have a marketplace where fans can sell mm. custom merch to other fans. 
We allow you to meet other fans, to go to different events and shows together and see really amazing returns of how, gosh, all I needed was, was an excuse. I just needed someone to nudge me or for me to get to know someone. And we see people now purchasing tickets because they now have fans that they've met on Fave. Um, and then we also power different experiences with our API and partnerships to allow for your fan level, your fan um, intensity, and kind of what you do to, to make way for other exclusives um, on either an artist website or other, other um, solutions there. And then all of this kind of action that happens with fans crystallizes in a product that we have called Fan Finder, which provides uh, kind of the lens. And <laughs> I say V because we have been told this is kind of the, the answers that a lot of people have been waiting for in the industry for, for decades of what every fan is doing, uh, where they are, um, how they're doing it, how intensely they're doing it, how recently they've done it. And the ability to contact them directly kind of based on these kinds of criteria from their fan activity um, and go from there. And so In the last year, we've all we've heard about is super fandom. It's, it's one of those sort of, it's, because it's sort of transitioned to the sort of annoying buzzword phase mm -hmm. where <laughs> we're sort of sick of hearing about it, but also with this clearly something important happening there. Before we move on to that, you were mentioning that it's an underserved uh, sector around music. Yeah. Are there any equivalent fandoms in outside of music in other places that are well served like this that you can sort of draw a parallel with whether it's technology or a community just to sort of give us a flavor of what music might be missing out on absolutely yeah i love that you you phrase that and to see where we can draw inspiration from because well yes super fans are now this this buzzword in the industry and you can imagine the, the the phone calls I got as as people started using the term that we've been kind of a martyr for for the last several years. Um, it has been one that is not a foreign concept at all in other industries. Sports, for example, mm. right, mm. has done uh, the fan experience very well, offering more than just consume the game, right? <laughs> you understand mm. the parallel here, yeah. right? And or consume it more or for longer but have so many, right, ancillary experiences that happen before you get to, to the game, before, uh, during the game, after, with each other, with brands, and have nothing to do with kind of the, the team itself or the, the, the league or whatever it is to bear on their shoulders necessarily, right? It's driven through the fan experience. Um, and then there's even other sectors within music, right, that have done it well on the East, that you recognize fandom is done very powerful there and mixing and matching different experiences to create an entire world around the artist rather than just the consumption of the IP, mm. um, right? And then we also see other businesses that look at their top 20% of customers, right? And super serve them in sales organizations. We've even had discussions with uh, software companies who are trying to understand, hey, we know that it's important to super serve our super fans or loyal customers as it mm. translates in other industries. And they have very dedicated experiences from, you know, retreats, right? To dedicated and targeted comms, to personalized solutions and taking out their best customers to dinner, right? Like these are all strategic that happens in the biggest brands in the world and bringing in those table stakes <laughs> into yeah. the super fan conversation, again, is just the start, but there's a lot that can be done uniquely within music, right? Well, why do you think this has not been done? Mm. I mean, okay, there's always been super fans, right? And there's always been extra stuff for them to buy. So, you know, if you, you can buy the ticket to the gig or you can buy the ticket to the gig and you can buy the merchandise at the stand afterwards, you know, for instance. But <clears throat> Why has the music industry not, you know, just cop just sort of followed that path around super fandom previously? Yeah. So uh, usually uh, my answer <laughs> to something like this is continue confusion. Because if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't have been this kind of crazy entrepreneur who thought it was silly and decided to go do it myself. So I wish I knew why it hasn't been done. But what you point out is probably um, a, a more important um, realization there is that, but what do you mean? We, we buy music, we buy merch, we buy VIP experiences. And I think that's the issue is just the consumption, right? Super fans are doing way more than consuming. Um, and even I, I think we talked about it with, <laughs> with a colleague in past that 
89% of the activities that we find on Fave are happening outside of actually listening to the music, right? Fans are creating different symbols in their artwork that represent their fandom, or they're going out and having conversations that break down the, the lyrics <laughs> around it, right? They are, you know, engaging in different mysteries and what ifs and, uh, you know, uh, suspicions uh, around what's going on or participating in different um, events that are just about the value set, right? And the things that are important to the fandom, or like raising money for a cause or going to a charity that have nothing to do with listening to the music, but everything to do about the fandom. And that alone, right? Like that realization is, is one. And the second is that that realization leads to a lot of revenue that's untapped, right? Again, fans are creating custom merchandise that, have, that don't even leverage the IP, right? And, and are selling it to each other. They have bonds where they want to deepen that, again, can lead to various uh, virtual goods and interactions that we're exploring right now, right? And I think that there's a lot of untapped benefit and value from the fan action, like fan-to-fan -fan interaction um, and transaction and ecosystem that solve for the things that fans are doing already, but allow for some of that revenue to lead back into the industry if done right. And if not, and I think this is the moment that we're in, right? If you don't have this direct line to tap into fan revenue the right way, you're going to get left behind. And I think no one is, you know, wanting that anymore. <laughs> We've yeah. seen it, th these waves happen, and this is a time to, to jump on. Okay. So then the basic question is, what is a super fan mm -hmm. in the sense of how do you define it at yeah. Fave if you're dealing with this market? Place. Mm -hmm. So what are the metrics you use to define one? And that has to apply, of course, to, you know, the billionaire Taylor Swift level mm -hmm. artists and also the, the bottom of the pyramid where you've got smaller emerging artists with super fans. So how do you measure it? And where does where is the line between very enthusiastic fan and super fan? Amazing. Yeah. And so so it, it's also interesting that you pointed out a difference between major artists and smaller artists. This is exactly an insight that we have when we oriented not on the artist, but on the fan. It isn't different, whether it's a garage band, you know, that you're a super fan of and will be just as active around. And if, if, not, if not more, because it's this like exclusive, if you know, you know, kind of vibe, right? Versus participating in a very well-known, super active, look left and right, you can find, you know, somebody, a, a part of that fandom, which we can all name the few names at this moment, right? And so there is, there isn't a difference in, in, in those economies, but of course there's a difference in the level of participation. And within the fan themselves, there is, uh, a, a, we, we look at it more of the, the number and style of activities that a fan participates in. And we typically look at around five or more <laughs> as a super fan, right? But it does depend on the type. There are the default activities that you mentioned, right? Buying different things, listening to the music uh, and being a part of it. But when there is a visceral connection that usually is sparked when there is a moment when the fan uh, realizes that the artist is about to take them through a personal journey, it, that's with every fan that we've talked to, there's always something that they attach to. Can, can you starts, give us an example of that? Because that's yeah. perhaps something that not everyone experiences. Absolutely. Whether it's I'm going through a tough breakup or I'm going through a loss of a parent or mm -hmm. I am feel completely alone in my household and nobody understands me but you every day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, or something that makes someone uh, see a difference that they have in themselves in the artist, right? Like that is a spark that we have found converts someone from a, passive fan, like I'm a supporter of your music and I'll listen to it when it's on and maybe I'll search for it, right? Because the vibe is right into a, I, you know, live part of my day in appreciation for the fact that you have shown me different ways to kind of go through what I'm going through. Like, mm. you know, it sounds much deeper than, um, than I think what a lot of people recognize that it's just about purchasing. Mm. And so that's the emotional side of it. But the activities span from 
when you start spending your time, even beyond your disposable income, to run a fan account, right? And, and that's a full-time job for, for, for a lot of people. Or to, again, introduce people enthusiastically to the artist to have them experience the same joy that you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. When you are trying to pull together fans for different campaigns to say, hey, let's mobilize together and either reach a streaming goal, right? Or let's, again, go raise money for a charity or let's go support these fans who can't afford box sets, but we can pull together and help them, right? Those kinds of actions that are around up-leveling the community and participating in the community, right, are signs of super fandom. And so... I would say for, for artists who are trying to understand whether or not they have this dynamic in their fandom, which, which I get that, that question a lot, it's when you can uh, point to or identify moments where people are attaching to uh, you beyond just the song, just the work, right? Mm. It could be through the work, and it, of course, usually is through the work. But when people can name that they you know love and adore you because of, again, what you helped them through, or the type of person you are, that's when you know that you're converting people into long-term loyal fans that, again, start participating in a number, right, of various actions every day. So, um, super fandom, it is the buzzword, the buzz words at the moment. <laughs> and it's, you know, if, you're, if any of you listening are going to a music conference this year, you will hear about it again, like you did last year. But I want to cut through the hype a bit um, and sort of say, well, okay, you know, people are listening at all ends of the spectrum and they're saying, okay, so what kind of, if I fully embrace super fans, mm -hmm. what kind of measurable uplift will it give me? What opportunities will it give me that I haven't had before and yeah. turn, you know, to turn that into something that's going to increase my profitability or whatever. Right. I think what's often discussed is the fact that you can squeeze fans for more than you're squeezing them for now. Uh, and yeah. unfortunately, we'll come, we'll come I, think, that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very simplistic uh, and unfortunate way that super fans are being interpreted across the board right now, um, which is why we have, uh, you know, a little bit of a calm, you know, despite all of the craze going on um, because we just know that this needs to be done right. And if anyone can suss out some, you know, BS around this, it's going to be super fans, right? To your point on the measurable opportunity, I think what people are missing beyond this, let's squeeze them for more, is that fans will go to work <laughs> for the artist without the artist having to do much, right? You can see it, you can be as lean in or involved as you want. But when people pass this threshold, they take it almost as a responsibility, right, to do and pour more into the community and are simply looking for ways to do that, right? And this is a very undiscovered insight, right, that we're very much looking forward to supporting the industry with, right, that you, like, what can I, what will change is that you will have a army, a super fan uh, uh, army, right, going to bat for you to represent you, your work, your goals, your effort to anyone and everyone who will listen, right? How can you turn that down? And not only do you have one person doing that, which anyone would kill for, for any brand that they are aiming to promote, but you have millions of people, right? Even if it's th hundreds, thousands of people, and you can imagine the exponential impact of you as a you know, solo artist who's trying to figure out how to represent themselves across all of these budding platforms left and right, right? but instead can lean into the effort of your fans to be able to put the mic to them and say, mm. can you support the, the reach and the amplification of, of me and my music? And the way that this can look, right, is instead of it just being, hey, you know, let me post a, you know, an exclusive photo on, on this platform, uh, it's instead, again, putting the microphone to the fans and asking them to hey, post a photo of the time that you remember where you listened to me for the first time or what you're doing right now that reminds you of a lyric of mine or et cetera, et cetera, just coming up with, with you know, prompts up, off the top of my head. But it's this nature of participation, this nature of recognition, and this nature of having fans be the ones to not just promote what you're doing, but again, have passive revenue coming in from their activity. 
instead of it being a, you know, takedown notice left and right, if you see, you know, a, a fan, you know, music video or a, uh, you know, a fan inspired music video or, um, or fan created merch where these are your cheerleaders, right? These are your biggest advocates rather than people who should be your adversaries. That is something that you can then tap into so that when they create this authentic piece of merchandise or throw this event with inside jokes, you know, sprinkled throughout that even the artist teams don't recognize themselves, they can have a much deeper, scalable, authentic experience that not like fans are, you know, not only looking to help with, but like, you know, eager to help with and anxious mm. to help with and would love to help with. And, and, and so I think often artists become a bit fearful, understandably, right? Of like, it's seeming to put power in the fans of, uh, hands of fans. And sometimes that, you know, that, that gets out of whack and doesn't go right. But when there is a strategic collaboration, right? again, through the help of Fave, but with fans, it is a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, one that puts money in your pocket, one that puts fans uh, recognized in a very win-win that we're looking forward to seeing here, right? And it's obviously something which is resonating with, I mean, the major labels, two of which Absolutely. have invested in Fave. Mm -hmm. um, and they, famously, they like money. Um, but um, also, so it'll be interesting to see how, that, as you mentioned there, the negotiation between loosening the control the strings of control a bit and handing it to fans, mediating that, and how that will work. But it's clearly an opportunity which is resonating with with, with lots of people. You, one interesting thing you mentioned there, and something which is important, I think, to to our listeners, is this idea of super fans being seen by some artist teams, some labels, whatever, as simply as people who will buy everything. Mm -hmm. And without wanting to point any fingers, you do see some artists releasing, you know eight versions of the same album on vinyl in different colors or whatever. And, you know, th there are certain fans who are whales and will buy everything. Right. I don't want to put the finger at artists, but it, you, that some teams are taking advantage of super fans and this, and sort of generating, like artificially creating this buy it all mindset. What do you think about that? I do think, and hearing from fans, right? This is, it's fun to collect. <laughs> so it's not to say that creating eight different versions of a vinyl is, is, is evil, right? It's fun, but it is completely <laughs> leaving money on the table from fans who can't even have it shipped to them, but are willing to buy, right? And there's no experience for them to tap into, even if they wanted to, from fans who can't maybe quite afford all eight, but, you know, could do other things that would put revenue in your pockets that are just from their efforts and engagement, right? Um, and are isolating the super fan experience to just those who have 8x what it would cost, you know, for, for this. And, and that's, just, that's what's unfortunate, is that there are plenty of fans who are really ready and able to pour into the pockets that are looking for these additional revenue plus more, right? In in a much more additive and inventive way, um, then is what is being captured now. Because it feels and like so, there's something slightly cynical about it, and also it's yeah. sort of corrosive. If you say, "Oh well, super mm -hmm. fan, we're just going to keep releasing more versions mm -hmm. of the record," and they'll lap it up until one day you kill the goose that lays a golden egg, right? Yeah, and 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 I think I mean what gets us uh, at Fave looking at the opportunity is everybody is you know pointing to this, you know, that amazing study that was done that recognized the $4 billion opportunity that is with Superfan that kind of kickstarted the attention here, right? Mm -hmm. um, at, at least across the industry. But that, like, if you break down what that estimation is, it's doubling streaming numbers for Superfans, which again, like, is a, that's a cool number, but it is missing the additive merch opportunity it's missing the additive engagement opportunity it's missing the additive events opportunity it's mm. missing all of the scale opportunities that comes from fans interacting with fans rather than just the artist to fan uh, engagements and and doubling right that that can be there right or or you know quadrupling in many cases so we just have a too narrow of a definition of a super fan and even in in faves light right we have you know, like one hat that the industry is wearing, maybe 
three, right? Across mm-hmm. streaming merch and, and going to a concert, but are completely missing, right? Like the 10 other hats mm-hmm. of, you know, fan artist, like evangelist, et cetera, that these fans are wearing as, you know, as your advocates. Um, and so, you know, while not every one of the experiences that a fan does needs to translate to revenue directly, you'll bet that indirectly and for that enga- that continued loyalty and participation in a community that means the world to them and pr- finally provides them the sense of belonging is going to pay dividends, right, to you as an artist. And those who recognize that from the ground up, right, and aren't kind of waiting for the moment where I have, you know, 20 million fans to, to go off of um, and realize that you can do that exact same thing and be, you know, making, like, uh, at YouTube, our, our metric was... Um, having creators be able to make a, a living off of their, off mm. of their YouTube revenue. Um, and I hold kind of that a, a similar hat now of, I want to see every artist be able to sustain and live life, making the art that these fans love in the first place, right. Without having to have the burden of keeping up all of these experiences and platform and engagement that again are scary. And you don't want to be doing that anyway, by leveraging the power of your fans. Mm. Right. How do you protect the the fans, the super fans, and sort of set up some guardrails for them? Because you've got you've got groups of people who are in this fan community, and you know, but it's nature; it sort of feeds off itself. And yeah. and you know, you've got you said there you've got fans doing a lot of promotion for you, doing a lot, mm-hmm. doing things on behalf of the artists because they really they want to do it how do you protect them from getting taken advantage of mm-hmm. because you know it it would be a miserable world where you've got an army of fans who are just sort of working on your behalf mm-hmm. yeah so this is interesting because that army of fans you know isn't just made up of um you know you know all the same level of fans right we in fact partner a lot with fan influencers who they themselves have grown uh, an influence and attention in the fandom, are well-respected and known. Uh, we often see at different events that we do when some of the fan influencers walk into the room, they're just as recognized as the artists would right. be if they walked in. They want pictures with them. It's, it's fascinating to witness. Um, but these fans, right, haven't been <laughs> approached a bunch, right, to, to have different deals and don't necessarily have the experience or, or backing or, or support to be able to understand how to work off of these kind of label asks or the ones that we bring to them or brands, right? And so we take it, you know, we we work with them and say that we understand what you're in it for. And trust me, <laughs> this is, we share the same ethos here. And these are the goals of the artist. These are the goals of the industry. How do we allow that to work with what is authentic? And that's the engagement. Fans find it. Um, almost relieving when they understand what the goal of the artist is so that they can serve and and better support those goals, right? They're not trying to go rogue oftentimes. They're not trying to be, be, you know, separate from what you're doing. They're trying to do exactly what you want. And so once we uh, align those, there's a much smoother story. And this is where faith comes in, right? Where we have these services kind of given this expertise to help drive those relationships but it doesn't have to be this, you know, intermediary thing, right? It can be through the product, through automated methods to be able to, to showcase to fans what is important and what you're trying to do, um, what guardrails you're not comfortable with, right? Like, for example, within the marketplace, if you don't want anybody to even have free reign to create something and you instead want to say, you know, Here, here's the logo, here's the placement, that's up to you. We will definitely restrict a lot of the creativity from fans, but that's a way... To, to protect fans from getting into heat that they aren't looking for either, right? Mm. Despite their creations, as well as the artists from, you know, being uncomfortable with something going too rogue that they aren't ready for. Um, and they work their way there. And so there's different levels and mixes and how much you can lean into your fans, um, how much you can support your fans and have your fans lead. Um, but having the whole burden on your shoulders as the artist I don't think is necessary, right? And even effective moving forward because you have a full suite 
um, to, to lean into um, mm. that will be far more efficient than I think many of the efforts that any artist team would do themselves. So looking ahead then, you're, you're obviously of the mindset that super fandom is going to become a fundamental part of how artist teams uh, not only operate, but generate income. Yeah. And you've sort of put a, a, a rough percentage figure on where that will sit. Um, the other big drive at the moment from artist teams, particularly at the DIY end, but this is probably through the industry, is direct to fan, direct to customer mm -hmm. Uh, relationships where they want to own the connection they want to have that data and they want to be able to communicate and a big part of that of course is being able to sell directly and own that process as well yeah. so is this are these two things going to merge do you think is, is this are these one and the same essentially of course and and this is exactly why we you know, brought FanFinder into into play here because driving and encouraging and empowering fan engagement is one thing. But what that leads to is this deep, detailed, powerful, right, data that isn't kind of given in this icky data sharing way that, you know, is like not serving fans, but instead allowing fans to be discovered, to be found, right? To say, hey, I'm I'm actually that one that you saw in the crowd, you know, with that sign. Oh yeah, here's my resume, right? Like here's what I've actually done. Uh, or yeah, that, that person that you see on social um, is that same person that bought in the merch store five times and has been to eight concerts, you know, and runs that fan account, right? Like that's this, marrying across all of these different platforms that you can now leverage in fave to see that across all of these different properties where you just usually have a user ID, right? To represent very basic info on mm. mate listening <laughs> over the month, right? Um, is now in this deep and detailed 360 degree picture on a per fan level to be able to leverage. And I, and I say this, you know, often in this uh, you know, layman terms, but of course this is, you know, powered by technology that, you know, I've been working in, in the AI, AI space since 2014 from the YouTube days all the way to the, the Google homepage and Google assistant, Google app. Right. And so was bred kind of uh, under this, making it much easier to interpret data, big data, right. Um, and detailed data points um, in the easiest way possible. So, with Fave, you can search in natural language, right? And be able to, you know, understand who your influential fans are, who the fans are that are going to an upcoming show, who the fans are that typically create and understand uh, how to prioritize different um, uh, content for campaigns that you want, right? Like these are the real problems and issues and, and frustrations that we hear from, from artist teams right now that they spend so much time trying to pull in, understand this, find this fan to do that. When instead it's, you know, this, this snap of a finger on fave. And so I'm looking forward to the time when we can spend, you know, less effort um, on management teams and on artist teams and, and, you know, confusion typically. But if you do understand it, right, effort to engage fans in ways that often don't serve the fan or, or, or you know, fans are, are have better ideas anyway often, right? Um, and instead can get to a point where we can, Leverage the, the understanding, gain insights, right? Have this data work for us and be accessible in a way that it can answer the questions that you're actually trying to, to, to get solved. Um, and then, again, have the ability and the understanding to, to have fans serve, serve these goals as well. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I will put a link to Fave, um, the podcast. People can check it out for themselves. And... Um, I guess, you know, this is, well, this is a conversation we're going to be returning to again over the, over the next year or so as this uh, sort of beds into the industry. And it'll be interesting to see, I guess, in maybe maybe two or three years, how how super fandom does become uh, built into um, artist campaigns and also artists that start on, on that route and then spread into the traditional industry from super fandom. So watch this space, I guess. Uh, Jaquel, before we go, one last question um, about, we've talked about fandom. So let's point the fandom question at you, which is if you could only listen to one piece of music for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, following a, a great call. So thank you again. Um, 
honestly the first song that comes to mind. So cheesy for me to say right now, but Till I Collapse by Eminem. I just would listen to the intro on repeat for the rest of my life. (laughs) Why? Why Why is that? Listen to the lyrics. Like, listen to the words, right? Like, and, and, and I think every person has a moment that they have reached, think they might reach, that is the impetus of them potentially collapsing <laughs> that, you know, if, and, and you can imagine what I'm alluding to in the journey of the fight, right. To, to bring even this business, this, this concept to life, right. Um, has been an undying one. Um, and one that we're s- so grateful for, for all the, you know, attention and buzz and, and momentum happening, but came with, um, a fight that, we persisted through. And not only did that hit when I was a kid, but it it continues to hit now. And so to not put your podcast in trouble by me spitting the entire verse right now, if you know, you know, I can, Joe, you know, I can, yes, yes, I can uh, please take a listen um, and apply it to your worlds. And um, yeah, get, get through these moments because it's worth it. <laughs> All right. I will link to that as well. So people can make the immediate jump from this to that. All right. Uh, Jaquel Horton, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Always always a pleasure, Joe. I appreciate it. And there you have it. If you found that useful, please do share the podcast on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. And of course, thank you to Jaquel for joining us as ever. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I would love to hear from you. You can email me on joe at musically.com. We also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up bits and pieces of the best news, analysis, marketing insight, and skills from across Musical.ly's broad range of services. Uh, So we can stay in touch that way as well. You can sign up uh, with the link that is beneath the podcast. All right, that's it. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I've been Joe Sparrow. You have been you. And until next time, farewell. Farewell.